let's consider the following problem known as pause flow. So we have two parallel plates. Um, we have high pressure on the left. We have low pressure on the right. We have our XY coordinate system. So we're just considering two dimensions. The height of our channel will be 2H. So the height goes from plus H to minus H. And the length of the channel will be L. And there's going to be a fluid inside this gap. And so we're driving a flow from left to right. And we want to ask the question, what is the velocity field in here? We're going to assume two things. We're going to assume one. We're going to assume first that we're at steady state. So there's no change in time. We're also going to assume that we have an infinite channel. So even though I've drawn a section L, we're going to consider this thing goes off to infinity in both directions. So it's essentially, we can assume, since we're going to assume an infinitely long channel, that we've reached some sort of steady state not only in time but also in space so that the flow isn't varying from point to point, that we've reached some sort of spatial equilibrium. And by that, we're going to assume that all the derivatives with respect to x are equal to zero. So these are two assumptions that will simplify the problem to allow us to solve it. So let's write out the Navier-Stokes equation for this uh, situation, and we're going to write it in component form in two dimensions. So we have three equations, and what we're solving for is our velocity vector, which has components u and v, and we also need to solve for the pressure p. So we have our two equations, which are the momentum uh, conservation in the x and the y direction, and conservation of mass. So let's look at our assumptions. So one is that we're assuming steady state. Since we're assuming steady state, we can cross out all the derivatives with respect to time. So the derivative of the velocity in the uh, x and y directions with respect to time is going to be equal to zero. By assuming an infinite channel where the derivatives with respect to x are equal to zero, we can sort of start crossing those out. So here I have the partial derivative of the x velocity with respect to x, and the v velocity with respect to x. If the first derivative is zero and we've reached steady state in space, the second derivative is zero, so I can cross those terms out. In conservation of mass, I can also cross <clears throat> that term out. So we've reduced the equations uh, a bit, but there's still some uh, work that we can do. Namely, one, we can look at this equation here that tells us the vertical velocity cannot change in the y direction. So what that means is the vertical velocity v is going to be a constant everywhere. And it has to be the same constant everywhere because its derivative with respect to y is zero. So as we traverse the channel in this direction, the vertical velocity cannot change according to conservation of mass. And since it can't change, and we know that at the wall, the vertical velocity has to be zero, what that implies then is that constant is equal to zero. So there's no vertical velocity. And so that's just saying that consistent with an infinite channel where the u velocity isn't changing in x, that means we can have no vertical flow since we're bounded by two walls. So now I can cross out all the terms that have v in it. So those terms go away, and that term goes away. So what we've uh, crossed out is every term on the left-hand side of the equation. And remember, the left-hand side of the equation, all those terms I'm boxing there in green, is really the material derivative of the velocity, right? The density times the material derivative of the velocity, which represents the acceleration. And so it makes sense, uh, now that we've done it, that there's actually no acceleration in this problem, right? Because we've reached steady state and time, so I'm not sitting here if I'm in the flow moving back and forth or sort of speeding up and slowing down because things are changing in time because of the steady state assumption. And because of this infinite channel assumption that we no, no longer have any gradients in x, means that if I'm in this channel, I'm just going to move at a constant speed. I'm going to just go with the flow, and that flow isn't going to change. So the acceleration is equal to zero in this case. So all those terms drop out. So what we're left with is only a couple of pieces left. We have that the pressure gradient in x must balance the viscous stresses in y. And we have that the pressure gradient in y is equal to zero. Now we it uh, should be clear here that we've made one assumption in the way that I've written the Navier-Stokes equations, which is for now I'm ignoring gravity. Now I'll work an example later with gravity, but 
uh, what we'll find is that gravity can change the absolute pressure in this direction, but it doesn't actually change the flow. So we're not really losing anything by ignoring gravity, but that's a point I'll come back to later. So let's write down our simplified equations. We have that the pressure gradient x balances the, balances the viscous stresses and the pressure gradient in y is equal to zero. So we can integrate this equation directly, which tells us that p is going to be a function of x only. So that the pressure can only change in the x direction. So here I can write this partial derivative as dp dx. So I could rewrite my x momentum equation as dp dx is equal to the viscosity times the second derivative of y. And really, if we think about it, this expression, right, since we took, we made our assumption that u does not change, nothing changes in the x direction, so u is only a function of y. So we could actually write this as an ordinary derivative too. So I could write du dy squared, right, because u is a function of y only. Now, if we look at this, we have something on the left, which is a function of x, and something on the right, which is a function of y. So what this implies is that the pressure gradient, since it can only change in the x direction, and that x direction pressure gradient has to balance this function in the y direction, the only consistent thing we can come to is that dp dx is a constant. And physically that makes sense as well because we're making this assumption of a really, really long channel. So it makes sense that the pressure drop per unit length would be constant. So if I have a little piece of channel, and the pressure drop from here to here, if I then go and double the length and add it on, would be the same as from here to here. So that's just the same thing as saying the pressure gradient is a constant. So we'll write it as dp dx, but we have to remember that dp dx is equal to a constant. And that constant in this case, dp dx, is just going to equal the total pressure across the channel divided by L. Now we have to be a little bit careful if we write this out because usually what we would do if we wrote delta P as being the pressure is here we have the pressure high, here we have the pressure low, and normally we would say that delta P is equal to P high minus P low. If we do that, we have to imagine the pressure is dropping as we go in this direction. So I would have to put a negative sign in here that what I would call dP dx, the derivative of the function pressure, is equal to the negative of delta P over L. Okay, so let's rearrange some things and just integrate this equation. So let's write it as du dy squared. Why don't we use the delta p notation because maybe that's easier to think about what the sign is. So this is what we want to be able to solve. So since everything on this side is a constant, this is something that I can easily integrate twice to get u as a function of y is a quadratic in y plus some constant times y, and plus other some constant c2. So we have to figure out how do we get these constants? Well, we always get the constant of integration by applying the boundary conditions. In this case, the boundary conditions are u at the top plate is equal to zero, and u at the bottom plate is equal to zero. So this is what we call, again, the no slip condition. So there's no fluid slip at the walls. So we can apply that condition. I'm going to cheat a little bit, so we could just plug that in. We'd get two equations for two unknowns. But I'm going to cheat and realize a certain symmetry about our problem, that I defined everything to be from plus h to minus h in our channel. right? And so what that means is that the velocity field better be an even function, better be symmetric about the center line, which means that constant has to equal 0. Now I see the symmetry in the boundary conditions because here I have y squared. So u at h and u at minus h, right, since the minus sign gets squared, is the same condition. So that immediately tells me the boundary condition what c2 is. So I can write my final answer as being u of y. So we get a parabolic velocity profile. So that means if we have our walls here, the velocity field will look like that. It would be maximum along the center line where y was equal to 0 uh, with a value of delta p over 2l mu h squared. And it will be 0 at the walls. So let's take our parabolic velocity profile and integrate it across the domain to get the total flow rate q.
so we can get a final result that looks just like Ohm's law. V equals IR. So pressure is just like voltage. It matters the amount we apply across the channel. So we write it as delta P. Q is the volumetric flow rate of fluid. So analogous in circuits to the current. And this factor here we can think of as the hydraulic resistance. The resistance increases linearly with viscosity, length, and as 1 over h cubed. So if I half the height of the channel, I up the resistance to flow by a factor of 8.